let's go to our guest line. We apologize for the technical difficulties, but uh, we do, uh, as promised, have the uh, director of athletics at Syracuse University, John Wildhack, joining us on the show now. John, thanks so much for coming on. How are you today? Hi, Steve. Hi, Paulie. Sorry about the uh, the technology gremlins, right? Yeah, no worries. No worries. You know, may, maybe maybe appropriate on Halloween. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, we're glad we're talking with you now. And uh, before we get into the season, I guess I w- let's start with with last night's announcement. I, I saw you on the mm-hmm. ACC network, and uh, the new uh, scheduling model is out. I know you had a big hand in, in making that happen. What stands out to you about this new scheduling model from a Syracuse perspective? I think for for us, I think it's it's a model that works well for us. Um, you know, we wanted Pitt and BC to be ter- our two permanent opponents. We've played uh, BC, Pitt. I think it'll be the 79th consecutive meeting next weekend in BC. We played over 50 times, so that was important to us. It was important to them as well. So I think that helps. I think the fact that there's a variety, a, more, a greater variety of whom we play. Um, I like the idea of going to Cal in the first year of the expanded conference. We've got a significant alumni base in the Bay Area. We've got a growing undergraduate student population base in the Bay Area and a really large alumni base in California overall. So I think that's attractive to us. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to be, because, um, you know, I was never a fan of the divisions. Um, I'll be quite candid here you know in the divisions over a seven-year period we played Clemson and Florida State 14 times because we played them every year uh, we'll play them six times over the next seven years so I think it's good to see a variety of, of, of schools um, Louisville is somebody obviously we had really good games with back when we were in the Big East together I think that makes sense to play them five out of seven as well so overall I'm uh, I'm very pleased Steve yeah and we should point out that you, you mentioned Florida State and Clemson you'll play them a total of seven times but between the two of them over seven years, you don't play them both in the same year, which is which is different and new and uh, seems a, a little more fair, right? <laughs> the fact you don't have to play them both in the same year. Well, it, it does, and I give a lot of credit to Michael Strickland, um, who oversees football, including scheduling for the ACC, because it's an impossible task, right, to, to you know satisfy all 17 members. Um, but I think Michael did a really good job. I was on the subcommittee. Um, of, of the of the football schedule, along with Bubba Cunningham at North Carolina, Dan Radakovich at Duke, Carla Williams at Virginia, and Jim Knowlton at Cal, um, had really good dialogue with them. Uh, as chair of the AD group, I made sure that Michael presented this to the ADs, and we got input from all you know from all 17 ADs. And I think one of the things that I like is there are there, there are some schools right that were it makes sense to have three natural three permanent rivals every year, right? Sure. You know, you look at, you know, North Carolina, NC State, Duke Wake, or Virginia, rather, because that's the oldest football game, college football game in the South is Virginia, North Carolina. So that makes sense. For us, Pitt and BC make a lot of sense. Um, I give Louisville and Georgia Tech a lot of credit because they kind of said, hey, you know what? We really don't have, like, a must-play that we need every year. So with them doing that, it allowed us to create more flexibility, and I think that will result in better games and matchup for fans. I think it will result in better matchups for, for ESPN, the ACC network. From a conference perspective, one game that did come back uh, that's an annual is Miami and Virginia Tech. That was really important to ESPN. And, uh, you know, you've got to take into the account um, – of requests of your media partner, but I want to stress it in no way at all, you know, was this schedule dictated or built by ESPN. It was built by the ACC um, and it was finalized by the ACC and the ADs. We voted on it uh, a week and a half ago at our meetings when we were down in Charlotte. And I'm pleased that, uh, you know, that we kept the confidential until the release last night. So I think it's, I think it's good for the conference. I think it's good for Syracuse football. Did you go into it, John, with you know, you mentioned Louisville, BC, Pitt. Did like Miami, Virginia Tech take priority to you also in Louisville, like the old Big East games? A, a little bit, Paulie. And again, you know, it's it's um, you know everybody had to be because everybody had specific ask that they wanted, right? And it's like it's like it's like playing Jenga, right? You remove one piece and the whole tower falls apart, right? I mean, literally one scheduling change that Michael Strickland made, it triggered 72 other changes. <laughs> so, 
you know, people, you know, you think, well, geez, why couldn't we do this? Well, the ramifications of every decision you make um, you know, are incredible. So BC and Pitt was, was our priority. I think it's good for us to play Louisville a little bit more. Um, you know, we'll see Virginia Tech more than we certainly you know, that we did in, in the divisional model where we saw them once every six years. We still have not hosted Miami here for as long as we've been in the conference until next year. I think that's great. You know, that we have Miami and Virginia Tech here. Um, I think that's really good. I think that's good for our fans. And that's impressive that you guys did it in the span of two months or whatever it was uh, to, to turn this thing around as, uh, as as big of an undertaking as it was. Uh, all right, let's let's turn our attention to the season, John. And uh, sure. you know, there's a there, there's a feeling around town. You know, here we go again. We, you know, with the we saw last year the the big losing streak towards the end, and and we know uh, you know the record in November of years late has has, has not been good. What, what's your take on what has transpired these last four weeks and, and you know, the last month or so of the season? Well, I, you look at the season in thirds, right? And the, and the first third went really well. And, um, you know, 4-0 and, oh and, and off to a terrific start. And the second third did not go well. Um, there's no question about it. So we, we still got a third of the season to play. And, you know, November is a really important month. We're going to play meaningful games in November. And it starts – this Friday with BC, and, and they're playing better. Uh, they've improved since they've made the change at quarterback to Castellano. So, you know, we've got to focus on the present. And the present is Boston College on, on Friday, and we've got to play better across the board. We know that. Um, the team knows that. The coaches know that. Everybody's frustrated. Everybody's disappointed. Um, but we still got a, qu- a third of the season to, to play, and um, we've got to go do it to the best of our ability. Now this losing streak obviously has you know has put Dino's name in the headlines for reasons you don't want Dino's name in the headlines right you know some national experts and and locally you know is he on the hot seat is is he going to be back next year so on and so forth I'm sure you hear this stuff um, with that in mind you've been very outspoken in the past about uh, you know the 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 need and desire for a 13th game uh, you know. If this team gets to a bowl, John, does that cool the the talk, or or is it, or is there more to it than just get to a bowl game this year? In your mind, well, it's, yeah. I mean, Steve, it's certainly our. You're right. Our, our goal is, and I said it back at the start of the season, is you, you, we know we're going to play 12. We want to play those 12. You know, um, good enough so you get that 13th, and that's you know that's really important. And, and we have expectations, we have goals, and and um, we're still in a position where we can achieve those. Um, I also understand, you know, the results the last four games have not been satisfactory to anyone, but there's still a lot to play for, and now we have to go do it. And if we do it, um, everything will take care of itself. You know, you say that, John. You, you got to do it. What if it's half done? What if you get the to the just the break, you know, the break even point, and you get to a bowl game? Will you handle it like an NCAA tournament bid? You know, do you look at strength of schedule? Do you look at how you got there? Quad one wins. You know, how will you handle this when you're evaluating the season then? You know, Paulie, I, I don't know if I'll go as quite as deep as the net rankings and things like that. <laughs> um, you know, let's. You know, we're not we're we're not going to apologize for any of the victories that we have, nor will we make excuses for any of the defeats that we've had. I have a question that I think a lot of fans have on their mind. So I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here, and I, I'm going to ask the question as respectfully as I can. So let, let's say, for the sake of argument, things are you know go really badly the next two games or whatever it is. Is there any chance you would make a move in season, or is it safe to say that this is going to be a let it play itself out? Let's see where you know. Let's see what it looks like at the end of the year. Is there any chance a move would be made before the end of the season? Steve, I don't, I don't want to get into you know speculation in terms of you know success we have or don't have that type of thing. Again, I look, we've got four games left, and and let's let's. It starts on Friday, and I think Friday is, you know, it's a really important game, um, you know, for a lot of reasons. We've got to get momentum back, um, and if you win, it's amazing. All of a sudden, you know, Bill Parcells, I think, was the one who said it. Winning is a beautiful deodorant, right? And, and we need to experience that again. Um, and if and if we have success, again, everything will take care of itself. But we know everyone knows the expectations and the goals that we have, John. You, we're all old enough to remember when Syracuse was Coach Mack, Coach P, and winning a lot of football games, beating SEC teams in bowl games. You know, 
Why has it been so hard for Syracuse to get back to that? And is it capable of getting back to that? Well, Paul, like, I think we can be I think we can be a really competitive team. And, you know, we, we did it in twenty eighteen when we won ten games. Um you know, last year we got off to a great start. We struggled. You know, then we you know, we beat Boston College. I do think, in some respects, when you go back and you compare a generation, you know, in terms of SEC schools, and I'm not going to say just Syracuse, but you know, with 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 maybe the exception of Penn State, schools in the Northeast and even some a lot in the Midwest. Number one, you've had you know tremendous population shift, right? Demographics. Um. And that has clearly benefited schools in the South, because if you look at states in the South and the population growth, and whether it's states like Florida, you know Georgia, um, you know North Carolina, et cetera, that type of thing. So I think it's I think the demographics, candidly, have, have and I've talked to other commissioners about that um, have made it more challenging, not impossible, but more challenging for schools in the North or the Northeast or the Midwest. Um, and I think secondly is, is what the some SEC schools did is the massive investments that they made in football, um, you know, put them in a position to, uh, to, to, to have, you know, tremendous success. Although even that's, even that's not, you know, investment doesn't necessarily equate to success, right? If you look at some SEC schools that are struggling right now in football, and if you look at their budgets, their budgets are astronomical compared to, to somebody like ours, and yet they're not having a heck of a lot of success either. Four games left in the season, John, and, you know, we talk about what the what the future looks like. Does it feel like there's a, there's a little extra urgency given – NIL and given transfer portal and given how quickly things are changing right now in college athletics, does it feel like there's a little more urgency to make sure that, you know, you make a decision and make the right decision in a timely fashion so that, you know, you, you, you don't fall behind in the off season. Yeah. I think when you get to this point in the year, there's, you know, in your, in your four and four or whatever, you know, there's a sense of urgency for every team, right. Sure. It's still there because we can still accomplish a lot. I think in terms of, you know, one thing I'll say with NIL, Steve and Paulie, I, you know, we're in a better position than I think people perceive. Um, we've had some donors step up and step up in a, in a quiet way, which is their preference, and I'm going to honor their preference. But I think we're in a better position there than, than, uh, than public perception uh, may think that we are. The others, we continue to invest in the program. You know, we did the groundbreaking, the new football operations center. You know, that's absolutely critical because we we have to be competitive with both our facilities, which the new operations football ops center combined with the improvements we made with the JMA dome, the Angel indoor practice facility, we'll have a package of facilities that's competitive and we need to be competitive in NIL. And I think Orange United, um, we launched last week a $500,000 challenge campaign, um, and we want to get that done by the end of the year. And fans can step up and support that. You can go to orangeunited.com and become a subscriber for as little as $10 a month. So, you know, it, it, it's more than just a well-heeled donor that it can impact NIL. You know, the other is we've got athletes who care, um, and they've been – in existence for over a year. They've worked with, you know, dozens of our football players as well. So I think we're a little better positioned in that space. But the one thing I will say, and I've said it before, is we need more local businesses to work with our athletes across all our sports. And the feedback we get from those businesses who work with our athletes has been overwhelmingly positive. And that's that's impactful and it doesn't necessarily need to be big dollars, but those are that's impactful to the student athlete, regardless of the sport. You know, John, you talk about NIL being important. How important is this game coming up on Friday and the fact that you need fans to support the football program at this game Friday night? You know, it's, it's, listen, Paul, it's important. And, uh, you know, we will have, this will be, in terms of ticket sales, this, this, uh, this has already exceeded Clemson. In terms of ticket sales, we've got to give fans a reason to, to, to get behind, to get loud, you know, to make the loud house the loud house. Um, and I think one of the things we've got to do is if you look at the last four games, the, the trend early on is we put ourselves in really tough positions and you can't play from behind consistently. You just can't do that. You know, we've got to create stress and tension for our opponent. We have to create stress and tension for Boston College. 
In the past four games, it's been us that we've been on the receiving end of that. And we should point out that uh, one Dwight Freeney is going to be in the house, right, on Friday and, and be uh, recognized for his uh, induction, upcoming induction into the College Football Hall of Fame. Uh, incredibly well deserved. Um, you know, clearly one of, you know one of the great players we've ever had here. Um, he'll be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame soon. Um, he should be, and maybe I'll see if we can suit him up for a series in the second half or something. Just, just to, just to have some fun. But he's no, he's 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 extremely uh, deserving of this. It's great to have Dwight back. It's awesome. He's going to go into the football hall, college football Hall of Fame in December. And, uh, yeah, I hope his presence, because he's going to be on campus Thursday and with the team, I hope his presence and what he's accomplished will be motivating to, to the team and to our staff. You know, John, it's the busiest time of year for us in sports. Uh, women's basketball exhibition game tonight, second exhibition game for basketball for men's uh, tomorrow. Uh, your thoughts on those two programs quick before we get you out of here. I'm, I'm excited about both, Paul. I think, you know, I, I think we've uh, – both programs, I think we've our athleticism is better than it was last year. I think we're deeper than we were last year. We've got really good returning players. I mean, DeAsia Fair is an All-American caliber player. Judah Mintz is an All-American caliber player. Then we've got those surrounding parts. So I'm very excited to see what Coach Jack's second year will be and what Coach, Coach Autry's inaugural year will be. Listen, John, uh, lastly from, from me, I, you know, I just want to say thanks for coming on um, and, and answering all our questions. Is there anything we didn't touch on that you would like to get across before we let you go today? No, no, no I, I appreciate it, guys. You, you, know, you asked uh, you ask the right questions. You ask them in, a, in, in, in an appropriate and professional manner. I respect that. Yeah, I do. I, I do hope, and I know our fans are frustrated, but I hope Friday that we have a really good showing, and, and they support our team. And we've got to earn that support. I I understand that too, but I hope our fans will really support, embrace our team. It'll be really good to be back home. You know, I know life's been crazy for you, John. I got to ask this question because it's Halloween. What, what what candy does John Wildhead give out on Halloween, and are they full size? Whatever my wife <laughs> <laughs> All right. that, is, that is a great answer. <laughs> John, thanks for coming on. Enjoy uh, Halloween with your family, and uh, we'll, we'll talk again uh, soon, I'm sure. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Go Orange. All right, John Wildhack joining us here on the show. And with that, we'll open up the phone lines, 315-437-7644. Quick time out here, back after this on ESPN Radio. 